If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bulletproof Selling. My name is Sean Rhodes. I'm the Chief Sales Sergeant here at Bulletproof Selling and author of the book Bulletproof Selling, a guide for systemizing sales on the battlefield of business. Here at Bulletproof Selling, our mission and our mantra has been since day one that hope is not a sales strategy. And whether you are selling a product, a service, an idea, or an initiative, chances are hope is entering the picture a little more than you'd want it to. It didn't work for the folks that I was able to travel and fight alongside on battlefields around the world. Didn't work for the Marines, the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets. Didn't work for the Air Force pararescue people out there. It's not probably going to work for you. So if you're in business, if you're in sales, you're responsible for two things, really. It's not just selling. That's responsibility number one. You're also responsible for serving. So if for no other reason, in, you know, increasing revenue is always good. Getting that bigger bonus, getting that bigger quota is always good. But we're really here to teach you how to serve more. And so since day one, we've been bringing on guests, folks that are Hall of Fame speakers, best-selling authors, folks that have helped salespeople around the world remove hope from how they operate. And we identify where our guest sees salespeople falling back on hope more than they should. And we build a system on every single show to help you address that very issue that you can use. As soon as you get off air with me, you're going to hit your computer, you're going to hit your laptop, you're going to hit your client list, and you're going to make sure you're using that system. And you'll be able to use it no matter the size of your team or the size of your goals. Now, when it comes to sales, it's a transaction. It's an exchange. You're exchanging time, you're exchanging resources, you're exchanging value. And one thing that usually ends up happening in that, where hope enters the picture in a lot of ways, is the assumptions that that salesperson shows up with. We assume that prospect or that customer understands why we're calling them, understands the value that we have to give, understands their world. Well, that's an assumption that often causes us to fail. It's a hope that we bring into the picture. So our guest today is going to help us unpack that, help us deconstruct it. And this gentleman understands the power of what it takes to produce value and raise it for other people. He has helped thousands of folks raise money for their business endeavors, and he's personally raised over $8.5 million himself. So without further ado, to help us unpack this issue, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show, Jay Connor. Welcome, sir, to Bulletproof Selling. Hello there, Sean. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along and talk about how hope is not a strategy. I love that byline. And I love it when you came here on the introduction, when you talked about, we're here to talk about serving people and not leading with this sales thing in your head. That's what it all comes down to is leading with a servant's heart. I can't wait to dive in with you. Oh, it's going to be some fun, man. So I want to know your your background briefly. $8.5 million you personally raised, but it's probably to the tune of hundreds of millions for all the people that you've been able to help along your career path. Uh, what do you do and who do you do it for? Yes. Well, thank you, Sean. Well, my wife, Carol Joy, and I live here in eastern North Carolina, and I was raised in the mobile home business. Uh, trailers, wobbly boxes is what they used to call it. Uh, but anyway, that's the business I was raised in with my father. He's 91 and a half years old. He'll make sure you know about the 91 and a half. Uh, Wallace Connor, he had the largest uh, retailing company of mobile homes in the nation at one time. And he's right now in the middle of a 350 home development that he's building out right now. So when I grow up, I want to be like my dad, Wallace Connor. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after we got out of the mobile home business, I knew if I ever got out of that, I wanted to get into single family houses. So in 2003, 2003, Carol Joy and I started up our real estate investing business, focusing on single family houses. Now we've done other real estate. We have built a shopping center from the ground up. We've done townhomes, we've done condominiums, but our focus has been single family houses. Well, Sean, the very first six years that we were in the business here in our small market, I relied on local banks to fund our deals. That's all I knew to do was 
go to the bank, get on my hands and knees, put my hands underneath my chin and say, please fund my deal and raise my skirts so they can look at my personal assets and everything about myself. And then he just say, yeah, you're there or whatever. Well, that worked fine for six years of funding our real estate deals. But then January, 2009, along with the rest of the world and the financial debacle, I lost my lines of credit at the bank. Well, God's way of, uh, of delivering what I wanted was, uh, I love the definition of coincidence, God's way of staying anonymous. I learned within a week of losing my lines of credit at the bank, I learned about private money, private lending, how individuals can actually loan money out from their investment capital and other retirement funds and fund real estate and investors deal. So since February, 2009, I have been working with private lenders, individuals, uh, to fund our deals. And then in 2011, I started working with other real estate investors on how for them to raise money. I love your show. Hope is not a strategy, but you know, here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. We hear in sales training all the time. You got to ask for the sale. You got to ask for the sale. You know what's interesting, Sean? I got eight and a half million dollars in private money funding from real estate investors. I got 47 private lenders funding our deals. Not one of them, not one of them had ever heard of private money or private lending or how they could use their retirement funds until I did something. I put on my private money teacher hat and I started <laughs> teaching these people what private money is and how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. I just said a second ago, all of us here in sales training, you got to ask for the sale. You know what's funny, Sean? Not one time have I ever asked anybody for money. And so I get the question all the time, well, Jay, how do you have eight and a half million dollars and you never ask them for money? In addition to that, I've never pitched a deal. And they say, Jay, how do you get people to fund your deals? And you never ask them to fund your deal. It's real simple. We leave with education. We leave with education. And when you're serving them and, and showing people how you can make their lives so much better, guess what? The money's chasing you instead of you chasing the money. You know, whenever I'm talking with somebody and I ever feel like I'm actually starting to sell or starting to persuade, I pull back. Nobody wants to feel that. If you're feeling it, they're feeling it. It's all about serving and showing how you can make an impact in their lives. And so with all the folks you've been able to train then, you know, hundreds of people that you've taught to do this in business, where do you find them falling back on hope? Uh, is, is it hoping that that you know, person they're talking to understands it enough that they don't have to ask for the sale? Where does hope enter the picture? Well, in, in, in regards to this subject of hope, you already say it on your show all the time. Hope is not a strategy, but what do you have to do? You got to deliver hope. You got to deliver hope to your prospective person that you're going to be doing the exchange with. How do you deliver hope to them? Well, first of all, there's two answers to that. You can't deliver hope and a solution to somebody else. First of all, you got to have your head on straight. You got to have the right mindset, which is all about this servant's heart. But along with that, you've got to be a really, really uh, good communicator from the standpoint, you got to understand your prospect's language. You got to understand where they are coming from. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see new people, it doesn't matter what kind of sales you're in, whether you're raising private money for real estate or whatever it is that you're offering. One of the biggest mistakes I see is talking jargon, talking industry insider stuff. We know like, you know, in real estate investing, we talk about ARV all the time. Well, nobody knows what ARV is unless you tell them, which means after repaired value. We talk about Mayo all the time. Well, nobody knows what Mayo is. Well, Mayo is maximum allowable offer. And, and you know, with your military background, Sean, I mean, you all got your, own, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> got your own language that nobody understands. So in answer yeah. to your question, before communicating with a prospect, you really want to understand, you really want to speak in language that a sixth grader, maybe third grader level can understand and don't use jargon. 
so if, if I'm a salesperson and I think I might be having this problem, how is it going to manifest for me? Is it just going to be longer sales cycles? Is it going to be uh, you know more struggles getting that second meeting? And how do I know I'm suffering from this? Because this is something that I think a lot of salespeople may be encountering, but it's tough to see the forest for the trees because I understand what I'm selling. I understand the value, but if I don't you know, get you to uh, understand it too, then we don't have a relationship. We, you know, we don't have a way to do business. So how do I know I'm suffering from this as a salesperson? Well, that's a great question. Here's why. If you are a salesperson and you don't have somebody that's a lot better than you listening to your conversation, how in the world are you going to know you're screwing up? You're, mm -hmm. you're going to think you're doing a fantastic job, even though your sales suck and you're not getting yeah. conversions, right? So first of all, get out of the blame, shame and justification process, right? A lot of people are walking around, you know, saying, Hey, well, you know, it's not my fault. You know, you're blaming somebody. What's well, the economy? It's the economy. You know, everybody's broke. You know, you know, when I need a solution to my problem, the first thing I ask myself is Jay, what did you do to attract this into your life? What did you do? Right. So in answer to your question, how somebody going to know if their sales are suffering? Well, you need to get somebody either through, uh, through hiring them or whatever. You need to get yourself a mentor. If you're particularly, if you are doing sales over the telephone, somebody that's like better than you needs to be listening to those conversations uh, or record your calls. I tell you one of the best ways to critique your call, record your calls and play it back and listen to yourself. Boy, is that going to be painful the very first yep. time, but you, you don't know what you sound like until you actually listen to yourself. That's true. It's absolutely true. And that's something that we've been advocating for a long time here at Bulletproof Selling. I think we're going to actually end up diving into that a little later on in the show, but I want to build a system to help salespeople better understand and speak their prospects language. Because like you said, the, the result of doing this is I actually don't have to ask them for the sale through education, through me showing them that I understand their challenges. It's a lot easier for us to establish a trusting relationship and for them to understand themselves. Oh, this person can probably help me. So in, yeah. in the military, every time we built a new system for our operations, helped us trim more hope away from our strategy so that we could accomplish our mission, bring everybody back home alive in sales. Every new system helps us trim hope away as well. So we use this acronym TRIM. You mentioned acronyms. Well, a simple one, TRIM. It's an easy one to remember. The T in TRIM is the trigger. So if I'm a salesperson and I want to start better understanding my prospect's language, when do I trigger this system for myself? Is it before I get on a call with them? Is it way earlier than that when I'm trying to figure out who my ICP actually is? When would you recommend as a salesperson I pull this one off the shelf and begin using it? Before you talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, don't do trial and error to figure yeah. out who your customer is. I mean, you you need to you need to know actually who that is. So how how in the world do you figure out who your customer is? Well, I tell you one of the most the biggest values I've gotten, Sean, is I surround myself with other people that have already been successful in my industry. One of the one of the biggest benefits that I have gotten, Sean, is joining mastermind groups. I don't care what industry you're in. Uh, for all I know, Sean, you got a mastermind group. And if you do, then your listeners, <laughs> if you do have a mastermind group, then your listeners should join your mastermind group because it's in that mastermind group that you're going to learn from other people. Actually, mm -hmm. you know how to identify who your avatar is, the industry. So, I mean, one of the biggest mistakes new people make is they try to do business on their own out on an island somewhere figuratively speaking. So don't start, don't start in business like I did. I didn't even get a coach or a mentor until I was in this thing for six years. And then I did. And I thought to myself, oh my word, what if I had gotten a coach or a mentor in business yeah. before, before I started, how much money would I have saved? How much money did I lose? Right? So oh, yeah. in answer to your question, you want to, you want to know this stuff before you even start. You know, even scripting, even phrases you use, right? Um, get the help, get, surround yourself with other people. And you, But I said in the industry, that's not necessarily 100% correct. I love surrounding myself in other masterminds that I'm in 
where people are in different industries because that are in sales, they're in sales in different industries. And so you don't have to self pollinate yourself with all the time, only around other people in your industry, because everybody in the industry, they're the really good ones are like sort of doing it the same way. So when you surround yourself in, in a mastermind group that has other industry uh, members in it, now you can draw from those other industry principles that you can use in your own industry. Love it. Love it. So if that's our trigger then. And we'll move to the R in trim, which is making this a repeatable process. On uh, the military, we're big on checklists. That way we can learn a checklist and be able to actually respond to the environment when it changes. So if I'm a salesperson and I want to better understand my prospect's language, I've, I've done the research. I've gotten myself surrounded with people in my industry. What are those maybe four or five steps you would ask a salesperson to consistently go through to make sure they're speaking their prospect's language? Practice, practice, practice. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example from my industry in real estate investing. So in today's market and for many years, most of our real estate deals has not come from listings in the multiple listing service. I'm not a realtor on purpose. I've had the same realtor on my team though for 19 years. And so most of our deals come from what we call FISBOs, another acronym for sale by owners, people that own properties that don't have their homes listed in uh, with a realtor. So since we're going to be talking to those for sale by owners over the phone initially, how do we practice? How do we get like really good? I mean, we got the script. We know what to say. How can I practice and get rid of the fear of screwing up? Which by the way, how do you really get good at something? You screw it up really good. That's how you get good. <laughs> at stuff. You just screw it up really good and take action regardless. Right? So, I'm going to give you an example in our industry as to how we get really good at screwing it up before we go live with real prospects. So what do we do? We practice. So here's the challenge when you're, if you're listening to this show, the challenge is what I'm getting ready to tell you, how can you apply it to your industry and your situation? So what do we do? We go on the for sale by owner internet websites, and we call up for sale by owners that have listed their properties in other states, in other areas, not in our area where we're buying. And hey, look, they got their home for sale to start with. It's not like you're cold calling somebody, you know, right. um, I was getting ready to say out of the phone book. We don't have phone books anymore, but you know what I mean? No. <laughs> so you're calling them up and now you're, you're practicing your script with a seller of a house that you're not going to buy. But now you're practicing. So I tell new real estate investors uh, in my industry, you want to make at least 50 of those calls. And no, I don't mean 50 calls and 75% of them didn't answer. I'm talking 50 conversations, 50 conversations with actual live people that have got their house for sale. And you talk to them and you get the information and you build rapport and you get comfortable. And you ask trial closing questions uh, and you practice clarifying questions and all that kind of stuff that the bulletproof selling teaches you. And then after you've had those 50 conversations, now you start calling your local market. Mm, okay. So we have my 50 conversations that are, are, I don't want to call them throwaways because you are learning really valuable things on those conversations. But then step two is begin, I need to start calling my local market. And what are some things that I can monitor on my calls or listen to after the fact that tell me I'm speaking my prospects language? I'm sorry. Ask that question again. Yes, sir. So uh, now I'm, I'm into my local market. I'm talking to people that are actually prospects for me. I can sell to them. If they said yes today, we, we begin to make a deal. How can I monitor my conversations or listen to them after the fact to make sure that I am indeed speaking my prospects language? Oh yes. So there's an app and forgive me. It, it, it escapes my mind right now. I actually have it uh, among my 50 apps that are on my phone, but there's an app. You can Google it. You can Google it. Google app, app, app for recording calls app for recording yeah. calls. And uh, so what you do is you go inside the app on your smartphone and you make your outbound call from that app. And then the app within your smartphone will automatically record the call. Mm -hmm. So if I'm and recording course, the call, then what am I listening for? 
and, th and then you're going to go back and listen to that, right? Yeah. And there's two questions you're going to answer as you're listening to that call. What went well? What did not go well? What can I do better next time? It's actually three questions. What can I do better next time? By the way, here's a side note, writer down or writer down, which ties in, uh, Sean, to your leading with a servant's heart uh, belief and philosophy. And that is, it's not about reaping. This whole world of selling, it is not about reaping. It's all about sowing, 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 sowing. It's all about sowing. It's not about reaping. What do I mean by that? It's all about giving value. It's all about giving value. So why am I here on this show? My audience typically are real estate investors. The majority of the people here listening to this show probably are not real estate investors, but you know what? One of my heroes was Zig Ziglar. And I don't know. Sean, I was going to say, Sean, oh, yeah. I'm old enough to remember Zig Ziglar. I got to meet him twice in person. Wow. What an amazing human being. But, um, you know, of course, we all know what Zig said. Essentially, he said, you help other people get what they want. You don't have to worry about yourself. But that's what Zig, the pot pan salesman, preached for decades. And that is, so give value, give value, give value. Because you know what goes around, comes around. I love it. So I'm, I'm listening to what went well, what didn't, what can I do better? Uh, now, is there something that I should be doing after the fact? So I, I've, I've hung up the phone. Maybe I've even listened to my call. Is there anything else I can do? Because there, there probably is, which is why I want to ask you to make sure that I'm speaking the prospect's language and that I'm getting better on my next calls. Well, it's sort of like what we said a few minutes ago. Share uh, three of those recordings with someone else that is better than you. And, you know, one of my favorite phrases uh, when I'm talking with people is, and this is a great question to ask when you're not looking to sell anything. And that is tell people, I need your help. I mean, God created us to help other people, quite frankly. Okay. That's why we're on this planet is to help other people. And so I just call them and say, look, man, I need your help. I know you're doing a great job. You're very successful in, in your sales and your success. And I need your help. Would you do me a favor and listen to three of my phone calls and give me your feedback as to how I can improve? Because I'm all about wanting to improve. Mm. Awesome. And you, you've actually uh, moved right into the I in trim, which is improve. Uh, that's something that we had to do in the military to make sure we were staying up to date with the ever changing environment. So giving your three calls to somebody better than you, asking for their feedback and, of course, taking action on it, making sure there's a change. Great way to improve. Uh, but now the final bit might be a little more difficult for us. I, I think you're going to handle it flawlessly, though. The M and trim is to measure. I want to know that the time I'm taking to do this, to record my calls, to get the feedback from other people that are better than me, that it's better than what I was doing before when I was winging it, <laughs> when I was making a bunch of calls and wondering why the economy was bad, why people aren't picking up the phone. So what am I going to measure to make sure that I am speaking my prospect's language? Is it just going to be more sales? Is it going to be better engagement? Uh, you know, more show up uh, for my next meeting? You know, no one's ghosting me anymore. What are the things I should be measuring? It all comes down to conversions. You know, one thing we track and all businesses track is what's your cost per lead? What's your cost per lead? That's important to know. Like in my business, I use Facebook ads. I, did, I use four different companies for Google pay per lead. I use outbound callers. I use postcard campaigns. Uh, I, I use direct mail letters to foreclose people facing foreclosure. Uh, I've got all these different funnels and channels and I know what my cost per lead is on each one of those coming in, but you know what? That's not the most important metrics. The most important metric, the most important, another acronym KPI, right? Yeah. The most important thing to track is, how much did you spend in either time or money or calls to get a sale, right? How, how much time do you spend? So, so hopefully you're, you've been, and you know, if you can't, I mean, you've said this all the time, Sean, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Mm -hmm. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So how are you going to measure your improvement? Well, here's one way you can do it that I recommend. Before you started asking for help for people to give you feedback on your calls, how many calls did you have to make? And if you don't know this, then for goodness sake, start tracking it now. 
How many calls, how many people did you have to talk to and how many times did you have to talk to them before it converted into a sale? Now you've got that yeah. step. Now you're getting feedback from someone else that's better than you. Now, the next 10 people that you talk to, are your conversions any better? Or are they converting mm -hmm. quicker uh, versus, you know, how many times you had to talk to them before? So what was the before conversions? What was the after conversions after you got the feedback and the uh, advice? That's awesome. That's a great way to measure, uh, not just gross sales, but how much better am I doing in the leading indicators now that I'm implementing the advice of people that are better than me? Uh, so Jay, that's an end-to-end -end system to make sure that we're speaking the prospect's language, serving more, selling more, and of course, building better relationships along the way. Uh, for anybody out there that's interested in what you do in making sure that one of the best appreciating assets in the world is part of your portfolio, uh, how do people get in touch with you? Is there a website they can go to to learn more about what you're doing? Absolutely, Sean. In fact, I just have started doing, and this is brand new, I've just started doing seven day private money challenges, seven day private money challenges. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm engaging right there. It's, and it's only 15 to 20 minutes per day of, of each video, uh, you know, training that I'm doing. So if anybody listening here to the show, if you want to come into my world and see how we're getting a bunch of money raised without ever asking anybody for money, then come join me at www privatemoneychallenge.com privatemoneychallenge.com i promise you we're going to have a lot of fun <laughs> i've had a lot of fun with you on this show sir already so i can promise that anything you got going on is going to be educative informative and I have no doubt the servant heart is part of your business model as well. Uh, for anybody watching us on YouTube right now, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button. For everybody catching the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere the podcast can be found, leave a review and let other folks know that hope no longer has to be part of their strategy. With the insights of folks like Jay, we can make sure that we're out there selling more and serving more. Jay, thanks for showing up today, giving back to the sales community. Let's go out there and make selling bulletproof. Thank you, Sean. God bless you. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.